Um, I'm going to be less polite than Robert, and I make no apology for that. Were I as polite as he is, I think most people who know me would be disappointed. So I won't disappoint. I'm going to be more scathing about what I think is happening and more outspoken, and I think it's really more serious than might appear. Robert has been... Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Twin Daggers, not the Twin Peaks. And uh, I'm going to give some background. And we need to understand some of the background Robert has covered. But let me just add a few of, let's call it, the big picture items. And firstly, the Financial Services Board was introduced the Financial Advisor and Intermediary Services Act with a rare thing in South Africa, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, that document has different names in different countries and different times. Uh, it was called by the Presidency in 1912 in Guidelines, uh, Regulatory Impact Assessment or REARS. There are guidelines in South Africa and since 1912, according at least to the Presidency, adopted by the Cabinet already in principle in 2007, we should have had every single new measure <coughs> in South Africa according to the Cabinet and according to the Presidency, ought to be preceded by a regulatory impact assessment or a cost-benefit assessment. Uh, it was stated in the medium-term budget of Minister of Finance, Nene, that we have already instituted socio-economic impact assessments, as they are now called, in South Africa, so we should already have them. It should be in place since the 1st of September, and no new measure should proceed in South Africa according to the Treasury, the Presidency and the Cabinet without some form of regulatory or cost-benefit impact assessment preceding it. The guidelines of the Presidency explain exactly what those ought to be and whilst one might have some difficulty with their guidelines, for example it says that each department or government or organ of state or agency should do its own. Very bad idea because of course they'll simply whitewash what they want to do. I'm not sure in the New South Africa whether we still whitewash things but that's what they would do. And so we did have here a very rare one. There were some for labour measures that said that the proposed labour bills would be uh, have net negative effects and this one commissioned by the people who wanted it, big mistake, uh, said that there would be massive benefits, the cost-benefit analysis. So it is now possible to go back and see whether those benefits materialized. And it won't surprise you to know that not only didn't they materialize, but the precise opposite happened. Everything that it said would happen, the opposite in fact happened. And so we're sitting now with a failed financial services and intermediary uh, law and a failed financial services board by their own criteria. You don't have to be an outsider to criticize it. You simply say what they said would happen and did it in fact happen. It didn't happen. So by their own criteria, they are not just a failure, but a catastrophic failure, a failure on a, on a gigantic scale. And uh, we can see what those were. They promised, for example, this was the rhetoric as well as the material, the literature in the, in the study, that we would have no more of these big crises we've had. Endless repeated crises, scams, insolvencies, rip-offs, losses, pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, they go on and on and on, literally hundreds of them, but the big famous ones were always mentioned. No more holiday magics, no more master bonds, no more tannin bonds. You remember the one that big rich people got themselves uh, caught up in the pyramid scheme? No more fidentious. What happens? After we were told that there would be no more of these, we got more. And we are told it again, and we will get more. There will be more. And the reason is because they simply, at the time, committed an old, thousands of years old common law crimes of fraud. And when Fidentia happened, Brown and Co. were not prosecuted or investigated under the law which was supposed to protect us from them, the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act, but under common law. They were charged with common law fraud went to the National Public Prosecuting Authority, went to the regular courts. In other words, the law, this monster, the Financial Services Board, which is meant to have foreseen and prevented this sort of thing, 
when eventually it happened, it was not even invoked. It was then irrelevant. And so it just fascinates me that people, and if I can speak to the media, this is a media briefing in particular here, why, is, why are they allowed to get away with this? It's a very interesting question to me in a country with a critical and independent media which we have and for which I have some respect, but for some reason in this case maybe it's obscure, maybe it's complicated, maybe it's too, I don't know what, but maybe they have a sort of good veneer but they are allowed to get away with murder. It is quite interesting that this is permitted and the whistle is never blown. Where were they? Why were they not doing what they do? It gets even worse. They declared Fidentia and all sorts of others that have happened. There have been many more African Bank and dozens of others. Many, many small pyramid schemes and others get, get, wound, get uh, started and launched and financial scams. They certified them fit and proper. So now just imagine the fraud permitted on consumers. The government says to you, we, this gigantic thing called the Financial Services Board, of which we now want two, as if one isn't bad enough, says the people doing this are fit and proper. Trust us. We have screened them. We have licensed them. We have authorized them. And then what happens is it turns out it's a fraudulent scam people lose hundreds of millions or even billions and I would like to suggest to any lawyers in the audience that it's time somebody actually sued the Financial Services Board for damages, for misrepresenting fit and properness, which they do on a daily basis. That's what they do. They say people are fit and proper when they manifestly are not. So why do we have them? Why do we have this gigantic monster? declaring people to be fit and proper who manifestly are not fit or proper. Um, the disasters are fit and proper and I would like to be involved in a damages action against the Financial Services Board. You might ask why don't financial services companies do this? I'm going to get to that. They're simply too terrified. They wouldn't dare squeak and we'll see, for example, in all of the submissions, thousands of pages of submissions on this proposed Financial Market Regulation Act, not one questions the principle. They're little technical details. This definition should be tweaked. This section doesn't really say what you mean. This section contradicts another. No query of the principle because the big companies, some of which are represented in this room, are too terrified. They dare not because the next day their doors will be locked and their computers removed and they will be shut down. That is the kind of power which they have and I'm going to get to that. Then there was this issue of, um, of the disappearance of the independent brokers in South Africa. Now when the Financial Advisor and Intermediary Services Act, which was supposed to be one peak or a holistic peak, was introduced. The Black Brokers Association of South Africa. Does anyone know the Black Brokers Association? If you don't put your hand, no, no, don't nod. You better stop because it no longer exists. <laughs> uh, so don't say you know them. There used to be one. These were the emerging independent brokers of South Africa. They gave evidence to the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee and they said if this law is passed, there will be carnage in the emerging independent brokers business and carnage, of course, for their consumers. Never forget that. I don't particularly care myself about insurance companies or brokers or agents. I care about consumers. They're the real ultimate victims and were on a spectacular scale here too. The Financial Services Board boasted in its report to Parliament it could not claim that it achieved anything. As uh, Robert said, it actually, in fact, achieved nothing. <laughs> uh, well, not quite. What it did achieve, for which it is very proud, is to put 16,000 brokers out of business. It said that. It said, we achieved this. This is some great accomplishment. Uh, how clever do you have to be to know what the color was of the people put out of business on average? Was there any big banks, any big insurers, any big financial institutions? And what do you think the typical consumer was, who now was no longer being provided by services? Uh, by 16,000 people. Not a single claim of anything concrete being achieved other than suppliers put out of business. Um, and they claimed, 
in the persistent failure that there would be increased persistency of policies, less mis-selling. In fact, it went up. In other words, what they themselves said they would achieve, the opposite in fact happened. Their own judgment, their own criteria, and what's more, uh, Anderson of the Financial Services Board is on public record as saying if these goals are not achieved, heat will see to it that they are dissolved. That never happened or discontinued. There are reduced rates of return to consumers for the very simple reason they've got billions of rands added onto their costs and obscene costs of this agency itself, which were given in advance as going to be small, and in fact there have been many multiples of what the costs were said in the impact, uh, in the cost-benefit analysis. All paid by consumers uh, and all added on to premiums and all less value that consumers in fact get. Carnage of the brokerage industry and uh, uh, and then we had supposedly benefits, amorphous, indefinable benefits. There are act in fact none, and a failed bureaucratic monster of which you're now going to have two instead. So if one fails, create another. And if that fails, we'll have three peaks, four peaks, five, just how many peaks could we have? And at some point, no, nobody stops and says, but hold on a sec, the first one failed. Why would two be better than one failure? And it did fail by its own criteria. Um, and then there is the total destruction of the rule of law, and I want to speak about this for a time being, and I, I say this not f to be melodramatic. The rule of law in this financial services regulation, as with we already have, and to the extent if it's possible to erode it more, it will be done, but it's actually not possible because it's gone in total. Let me explain why I say that. Uh, the Financial Services Board is a big brother. It is what... Uh, Professor Vivian calls a state within a state, and um, uh, this is what he means by it. That it makes its own law. It now basically, through the laws it already has, more so with this, it, just, it already can make any financial service law it wishes, uh, but there is, it says a suite of new laws will come in that basically mandate these two peaks, currently one, uh, to make any law they like regarding financial services. In other words, Parliament is in fact redundant, and despite that, the uh, chair of the parliamentary committee is on record, I think yesterday or recently, I've just been told, to say they can't work through the volume of legislation before them, all of which basically just dis dis gets rid of, to disposes of their own power to the regulator. In other words, laws will be made in Pretoria, not Cape Town, and that, of course, is a complete violation of the concept of the separation of powers, which is that legislation should be made by legislators, adjudication should be done by adjudicators or the judicial branch of government, and the executive branch should execute or implement. That has now fallen away, and we now have one agency, by the way, the Financial Services Board, you, um, the most informed people in South Africa regarding it are in this room, and I wonder how many of you know the name of one single person on that board. Certainly for South Africa as a whole, this is an anonymous, mysterious, faceless bunch of people who meet in smoke-free rooms and make laws to the extent Parliament cannot make laws. Parliament cannot make laws the way they do. It has to go through legislative and statutory procedures, public uh, statements, interviews, uh, gathering information, three readings in Parliament, two Houses of Parliament, and so on. So it is, uh, it, its sole legitimate function would be to implement law. It does very little of that. What it does is it polices the law. Uh, sorry, that should have been polices, not policies. That's a spell-checking, changing things. Uh, prosecutes violations, so the National Prosecuting Authority is redundant. Adjudicates, it's the judiciary has been rendered redundant. It imposes fines, which they call penalties. Uh, that, uh, and it keeps the fines, which makes the Treasury redundant. And it is therefore just a... If all of the functions of government are now within this one amorphous, nameless, unknown, unaccountable, unelected, a mysterious group of people and there'll be now two groups doing what one used to do or what one currently does. So now I have a new word for you, word for the day and uh, uh, in my weekly newspaper columns I play a little game. Some of you might not know this but 
literary personality, Gordon Forbes, said to me when he reads my columns, he has to read, reach for his dictionary. And that's precisely what I wanted to achieve. I, I weasel in one word, which I think is a good word, which everyone should know, and which I presume they don't know. And uh, the word for today is yatrogenic. Now, if you don't know the word yatrogenic, you should. It comes from the Greek for uh, yatros, which means doctor, and genic cause. Yatrogenic is a term used in medicine and psychology for when the treatment causes the problem, when the treatment makes the patient worse. Uh, our financial services regulation, and particularly Twin Peaks, are yatrogenic. So when everyone, anyone says to you, what do you think about Twin Peaks, say it's yatrogenic. <laughs> and uh, this is a hell of a good way to impress people at dinner parties, I promise you. Uh, but it is yatrogenic. It will have precisely the consequence of the remedy for an unknown problem, unquantified. There is no known problem. Uh, the Treasury said that the Financial Services Regulation Bill is a series of bills. Heaven knows what more, because they don't really need any more bills. They've already got all the power they want. And it's supposedly a response to the financial crisis. Whoever wrote that, I mean, Robert had his version of somebody who wrote something, couldn't have known what they were talking about. Well, this is something somebody didn't know what they were talking about. There is nothing at all in <coughs> what people call the financial crisis of it, as if it was singular. Uh, there were, in fact, two. There was the American subprime derivative crisis, which is a banking crisis, and the Southern European or Mediterranean European crisis, which is a sovereign debt crisis. The second one is governments not being able to recover the money and going into debt, so it's got nothing to do with the market, nothing to do with financial regulation. It's simply government overspending, the Greek crisis and the Spanish crisis and so on. And the banking, the subprime derivative, derivative crisis is a crisis caused by Freddie and Fannie, which are government-sponsored enterprises of what we might call parastatals, which promoted subprime mortgages, which we would call not creditworthy, and it bundled these into derivatives and sold them all around the world, pretending that the U.S. Treasury would underwrite them or back them. And this caused all, caused all sorts of people like our old mutual to invest many billions and trillions into these derivatives, uh, sponsored and promoted and launched and for practical purposes created by the government. And none of it had anything whatsoever to do with insurance and nothing had had anything whatsoever to do with the proposals in Twin Peaks regulation at all. So not only was there no such thing as the crisis, it was a confined to crises, confined to people who had subprime derivatives and confined to a few European countries. It was not a global crisis. Global growth rates didn't decline. In fact, African growth rates rose at the time and continued to rise. And I see Chris Hart in the audience over there, top South African economist. When I looked at the World Bank data for 2008-2009, I couldn't see where the crisis was. Most countries had rising growth rates, and a few countries had uh, flattened growth rates. Something like half a dozen had about a quarter or a year of contraction, uh, very, very small. And I phoned him and I said, there's something wrong with the World Bank data. Where was the crisis? And he said to me, you're quite right. It's one of these things that floats around <coughs> in the cosmos as if it was actually there, but in fact it was a, uh, a too specific and narrowly defined geographically and in institutional terms crises. Um, so again, we're going to have this monster that has noth there's nothing in it that has any logical link with the crisis at all. Even if you say the crisis was about some bad banking practices in America, which it wasn't, no connection at all. Just a cliche that gets popped out. Oh, we have to prevent, you know, bec we, what the lessons we learned from this crisis. They actually don't understand the crisis and learn nothing from it. And there's nothing in the Twin Peaks proposal which is of any relevance to it whatsoever. So, um, so let's look at the, uh, I've got to move on to g get to the concluding bits. Uh, but there is nothing empirical. The, the government, the cabinet, the Treasury, uh, the Cabinet and the Presidency require a what is now called a socio-economic impact assessment. There is none, nothing, nothing, there is nothing. We are told about amorphous problems, risks, obligations, abuses, uh, this tondi, this fictional imaginary, it says, well, imagine if, and then it has a whole lot of 
literally nonsense. Therefore, we need regulation without any link with why that would prevent Tondi's imaginary fictitious problem. No actual problems that have been solved or that it could solve. And to the extent there have real, really been problems, it's been the ombuds or ombudsman officers that have addressed those problems or the courts through the law of contract. So no problems, no quantified problem or what is called in law the mischief principle, no quantified benefits. What is going to be better afterwards? Nothing. Nothing other than, oh well, there'll be less problems or we'll have, I don't know, we'll have financial stability and security. No reason at all why that should <coughs> be the case. Uh, no costs. What will it in fact cost the private sector and the government? We've heard that it could be uh, a few billion rand, I think that is a very conservative estimate of Professor Vivian's, it's probably a great deal more, uh, and there's no rational nexus between the two, and no concern for unintended consequences, market distortion effects. If you interfere with markets, there are consequences. You should in advance know what are they likely to be, what are we likely to have less of and more of as a result of interfering with the market, maybe good or bad. And it's anti-transformation. It makes it increasingly difficult, actually impossible, for emerging businesses to enter the market. This puts it beyond the reach. And this is the one area in South Africa in which the opposite of transformation has happened. There has been a reversal of progress that had been made <coughs> uh, from a racial transformation perspective. And there is a presumption of free lunches. Uh, Tom Stafel stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. That's the other word for the day. You should all know iatrogenic and transtafel. If you know those two words, you get a PhD in economics because that explains <laughs> all there is to know about economics. And uh, they assume you can have benefits at no cost. And, uh, oh dear, I don't know what's happening over there. Uh, they also talk, what's interesting to them is the authorities. This is in their, the, the Treasury documents explaining and justifying this. I love the word, the authorities. They are authorities on nothing. But not only are they not authorities, but they spell it with a capital letter, which I love. The authorities will do this and do that, and they will issue standards, and they understand stuff, and they're clever, and they know things. Uh, Norton Rose, very one of the big six law firms, and one of the top constitutional lawyers, uh, advocate Gilbert Marcus, senior counsel, have said that they think provisions in this bill are probably unconstitutional. Uh, Professor Vivian, also a lawyer, says they are most definitely unconstitutional. Uh, in the thousands of pages, there is the supplication. The biggest financial institutions in South Africa have submitted evidence, thousands of pages of evidence. A summary of it is available on the Treasury website, 330, uh, 337 pages. And none of them raise any question of substance. Why not? Why do the people like some of the companies represented in this room not actually go and say this is a bad idea conceptually? All I can think of is that they're too scared. They don't want to upset. So all of the submissions, page after page after page, are supplicating, submissive, and words like, you know, PPS, supposedly big and strong, says, we would like their, f uh, we would like their f or we would like to suggest, if we may, like this, you know, please, you know, uh, may we suggest that you've got a definition here which is maybe not quite what you had in mind. The giant conglomerates in South Africa are terrified of this monster, and they should be, because it can fine and shut them down, as we've heard some companies have done. And um, uh, there's no mention of, uh, of submissions from or mention of consumers in any of the documents, as if consumers are not the end goal of this. They are, there are no consumer submissions that I could see. If they are, they're not in the official summary. And there's no mention of consumers and the rights or interests of consumers or the costs to consumers or the implications that I could see. And I might have missed them, so I apologize in advance if I did, because I didn't read it all uh, thoroughly. Um, so all regulation is people control. I like to just point this out. They talk about regulating financial instruments and financial products and financial money. No, you don't. You've never seen someone from the FSB running down the road chasing a financial instrument. Uh, financial instruments don't misbehave. People do. All controls are controls of people. And they are particularly controls of consumers. They are controls of what consumers may and may not buy. 
That is what this is. This is should be called the Consumer Control Act, not the Financial Markets Control Act. It's the control of consumers. Uh, these mythical problems, fabrications, fantasies, fairy tales, no actual problem ever solved. Impending problems will be averted. Which problem will be averted? Can they show us any one they have ever averted? And the answer is no. So I am very scared. This is an unstoppable joke at Norton. It won't be stopped because it is now so big and so dangerous that nobody dare actually take it on other than me because I'm not a financial institution and I'm not rich enough. They can seize all my assets, the asset forfeiture unit who will help them. Uh, and it will be worth nothing, so they will leave me alone. You see, so I can speak freely, but not many people in this room can. Or Professor Vivian, because he's a retired academic, he's got his stipend, nothing they can do to him or me. So you're listening to two of the very few people in South Africa who can actually speak about the issue. Everyone else is too terrified and intimidated. 16,000 intermediaries driven out of business, carnage of the black brokers industry, and so on. So, um, the Deputy Director General Mamoni it says he wants Financial Services Board autonomy, meaning a state within a state. He wants draconian powers. He's not even embarrassed about it. He wants intrusive powers. He doesn't want a light touch and, uh, and an omnipresence in spirit. They want to be everywhere you move. Uh, so uh, Chris Hart over there, they will, you cannot escape them. They will just be hovering over your shoulder day after day. And uh, uh, they want to act before there's a transgression. They want the power to take action against you when you've done nothing wrong. Uh, Professor Vivian did point that out, and I want to repeat it. Uh, there are never any specifics. And um, uh, I just want to suggest that it really is time to stop burying our heads in the sand and face up to this monster and do and say something about it. And if we can encourage people in the media to realize that no one in the Financial Services Board is going to help you. You can call them and they will not come on your radio debates or TV debates. They will not give you any uh, nice uh, usable media statement uh, because they know that the price to pay will be, will be excessive. So with that, uh, uh, we finished, and Robert and I will answer questions. I find questions always very easy. I usually don't know the answers. He does.